I am, would like to start by introducing all of our panelists. Um, we're going to start with Mike Levin, who co-founded the Jewish Future Pledge to carry on his family's commitment to Judaism. Mike was inspired by Warren Buffett and Bill Gates' Giving Pledge. He's devoted much of his time to it since ending his tenure in 2019 as the chairman and CEO of the Georgia Aquarium. Mike has also served as president and chief operating officer of the Las Vegas Sands Corporation, chairman and CEO of US Franchise Systems, president and COO of Holiday Inn Worldwide, and the president of Days in America. Uh, we also are being joined very shortly, hopefully, but with, by Terry Castle, who's a member of the board of directors of the Pauli Singer Foundation and chairman of the board of the not-for-profit startup Nation Central. Terry serves on the management committee of the Elliott Management Corporation, where she is counsel and head of strategic human resources. Previously, she was global head of human resources and a member of the operating committee at Merrill Lynch. Uh, we're also joined by David Zalek, who's an entrepreneur and a leader in the field of financial technology. David founded Green Sky in 2006 and now serves as the company's chair and CEO. He built his first company, Microtech Information Systems, at the age of 14. Mr. Zalek was born in Beersheba, Israel, and now lives in Atlanta with his wife and their three daughters. Um, and we are also joined, finally, by Eric Fingerhut, who's an American Jewish businessman, former congressman, who's devoted his professional life to public service and higher education. He is currently CEO of the Jewish Federations of North America and previously served as CEO of Hillel International. So I thought that perhaps we could start with Mike, um, who, in addition to starting the Giving Pledge, um, comes to us from a world of hospitality, which is an industry right now uh, experiencing incredible challenge, um, and challenge that maybe somebody else might not have seen coming. I wanted to know if you could talk to us a little bit about your experience in that industry and the ways in which it may have inspired you to create a project um, that essentially has at its heart trying to see into a future we can't see. That's a very good question. I, I, uh, I didn't expect to talk about hospitality, but I'm happy to talk about it because I've done it for over 50 years. I think, I think what's happened uh, and what, what's happened to us in the world, what's happened to us in the Jewish world, what's happened to every people every corporation, every individual laborer at every level of the economy with this particular situation is dire. The hospitality industry, which includes also tourism, airlines, uh, as well as restaurants, et cetera, have been hit dramatically. I'm still on the board of a hospitality company who's in serious difficulty at the moment because there's nobody in their hotels and they've closed lots of them. I think, I think it's almost impossible for uh, for, 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 the, for, the company, for the companies as well as the leaders to understand what can happen in the future. And basically, basically, when a situation like this occurs, it takes an enormous amount of people, enormous amount of energy, enormous amount of creativity to fight, fight the crisis that's happened, but it could not be anticipated to be what, what has happened. It's more than anyone could understand most of my peers who've been around have never experienced anything in their lifetime at this magnitude. The Jewish Future Pledge is something that prepares, I think, for the Jewish people in the state of Israel for the future. Uh, it's, not, it's anticipating that something may happen by passing this information to the next generation. So I think that's the comparison. But I think it's almost impossible to say in the, in the world itself to prepare for emergencies like this. It's something that I think none of the panelists have experienced and probably uh, how, it, until it happens, you have to be in a reactive mode. What I wanna do with the Jewish Future Pledge is be in a proactive, proactive situation to protect the next generation of Jewish people. So hospitality is a good example. I see the work that's being done, big article today in the Wall Street Journal talking about hospitality companies in, in dire stretch. Right? Nothing, there's nothing you can do to prepare for something that you anticipate will happen like this. David, could I, um, could I ask you, because you come at this from a different generational perspective, um, and 
I guess my question is, um, when you were thinking about your own participation in this, were you thinking about um, the kind of crisis that nobody could foresee, or were you thinking about just the general health of a community humming along? Um, how did you come at this? Um, I guess what I'm asking is, is um, were you preparing for something that none of us saw coming, or is this something that surprised you too? Um, I was uh, not preparing quite for Armageddon uh, plagues. <laughs> uh, actually, we have locusts uh, swarming Africa. I'm not making this up. Um, so these are uh, arguably biblical times. I don't think anybody, any of us expected that. I, I think it was um, Mike Levin's fault. Okay. I heard Mike first talk about this, and I turned to my wife, and I said, uh, holy shit, he's right. That's what we're doing. We're allocating the vast majority of, of our charitable dollars, but why aren't we talking about it? Why aren't we encouraging other people to do it? I, I do think that um, particularly as American Jews, we have civic responsibility, civic obligations, um, and it's appropriate to invest in the broader community. But as Jews living in America, it is also very important to remember that if we don't invest in the Jewish community, no one else will. And so when Mike put into words the thoughts and the actions and codified it, it was, it was just absolutely obvious. And it was, I think, for, for us, a clarion call as to, wait, we should declare this. It's what we're doing but we should declare it. We should declare it so that our children know where we're coming from and so that perhaps others will be inspired or take note and maybe that will influence others. So, um, uh, you know, Tzedakah is not only about community building, but it's also about community saving and, and helping people um, who are really in bad shape. We're gonna have a lot of people that have lost their jobs, are gonna lose their jobs. Um, and so while we want more day school and more day school enrollment and a stronger JCC. We, we also want to support the community um, and, and the elderly that might have diminished services and um, uh, food. So I, I just think, you know, as, as per usual, Mike was ahead of the curve. And um, I think a lot of us are happy to follow. I want to come, I'm going to come back um, to the, um, to sort of the idea of um, investing in the general health of a community um, versus uh, crises. But before I do that, um, Eric, arguably nobody, certainly on this panel, um, has your view of the Jewish philanthropic world in the recent past, but also throughout history, um, and the ways in which it interacts um, with itself and with the outside world. Um, could you give us a sense of what you think uh, something like this project would do for this landscape? What is it, what happens, what's the reaction um, if you do a huge, I mean, this is a very, very large, ambitious project that in some senses one could see would really change the nature of some of the relationships and some of the values of this landscape. What do you see when you look out onto the, onto the space? Well, uh, I would say two things, uh, Lana. First, obviously, the the opportunity for community building that would come from uh, the resources that this pledge could help keep within the Jewish community is extraordinary. I mean, the title of this panel was something like the six hundred billion dollar, you know, opportunity. So uh, it's obvious to everybody in the Jewish Funders Network that if those resources were to leave the Jewish community versus to stay in the Jewish community, the, the dramatic impact it would have uh, on all of our communal institutions. Uh, you know, we're in a moment now where our community institutions are, are literally at risk. Um, uh, it, you know, it's happening in a short window of time so we can see what it would look like if gradually we allowed our, our communal institutions to dissipate and we can't let that happen. And so from a financial standpoint, that's the opportunity here. But, but, but what I want to say is that, you know, ultimately philanthropy 
is just one aspect, Sadaka is just one aspect of Jewish education. We are all educators. Uh, you know, the Jewish people are uh, our, our master experiential educators. In a couple of weeks, we're going to sit down to the Passover Seder, where we're going to tell a story uh, and teach our children in an experiential way. You know, every Saturday, we all read from the same portion uh, of, uh, of the Torah and discuss the same thing in an experiential way. What, what I have to say, what, what really got me when I sat down with Mike and, and talked about this was uh, he described it as an opportunity to open a conversation with our children uh, and to teach our children about their responsibilities. Uh, first of all, about what a community is, how a community works, and to teach about uh, the uh, communal responsibility through the experience of the parent and the grandparent. You know, we're not born genetically with the, with the knowledge of how a community works and what our responsibilities are to community. We, we teach our children. And we do that through our example. We do it through, um, you know, through involving them in, uh, in philanthropy and in community building projects. And we do it through the heartfelt conversations that will happen between generations through this pledge. So I have to say that even more important than the financial impact, which surely I am here to, to advocate for uh, as the head of the Federation system, um, is the educational uh, uh, and, and almost, you know, spiritual impact that will come from the conversations that will happen intergenerationally as Mike Levin and, and David Zalek and everyone else talks to their children about why they've allocated their philanthropy the way they have and why they are putting in place a promise uh, and, and a request, really, to the next generation that, that they do the same. So, Mike, maybe you could actually um, help us because I think that there... For some people, at least when it came to the uh, Buffett-Gates pledge, there was uh, an assumption um, that effectively what you were doing was taking uh, control out of the hands of future generations. Um, but the way that Eric presents it is actually this is the way to open up uh, a kind of joint uh, decision-making process, a decision-making process that involves uh, passing on a set of values, not simply dictating them. But can you tell us um, how you think of it, how you imagine that's happening um, for you and maybe for some of the other people? And I'd love for David um, to talk about that too. How, how does that actually work? And how do you instill in the culture of the givers in the pledge, this idea that this isn't diktat, this is, um, it's a partnership with future generations. Well, I think, I think the, uh, the answer to that question, David mentioned something about who's going to take care of Jews if we don't take care of Jews. That's very important, I think. Uh, there is a democracy in the giving pledge because it does say that the next generation is going to make their own decisions over the 50% or more that's left for Jewish charities and Jewish right. organizations. Uh, I specifically have been asked many times, uh, why, what if somebody's going to give to a Jewish organization that you don't like? And I say to them, uh, that's not my issue. My issue is if there's a J in front of the organization, that money is going to be supported. It's up to me to teach. It's up to my children to teach their children to teach. Uh, I want to just mention, so I think that that's different. The, the, the Buffett Pledge, I studied it very closely. I know two, pe two or three people who have done the Buffett Pledge. And basically, they're just making a commitment of their charitable resources. Right now, only about 11% of Jewish giving goes to Jewish causes. I'm not concerned about the other 89%. I'm concerned about the next generation in terms of if that money goes down, what's going to happen? Right. I just, I, I don't want to take too much time to dominate the conversation, but I don't know if you're watching The Plot Against America on HBO, but something happened there. And you may remember this box. Yeah. In the first institute, in the first issue of The Plot of America, there's a knock on the back door. Well, that reminded me in 1940 of the knocks on the back door that happened to me in Boston in my apartment when an old man just like that came to the back door. And I just purchased two of these boxes on an auction because I couldn't find them. And I have them, I have them in my house. 
because but the, the, the coordination between learning that that's important. My kids, my grandkids will see these boxes and you see, that's what they want to have. It's, and look, it's biblical, as David said, door, the door of a door was taught 3000 years ago and it's still being taught. But my concern is a Buffett pledge is easy for a billionaire to say he's going to give away half his resources to charity. Doesn't mean anything. He's still got hundreds of millions of dollars to support his family. I want every Jew, old, young, medium, every, every age, to be able to say they have a responsibility to give Jewishly to support Jewish people in the state of Israel, because frankly, I think it's going to be part of our survival. So can I we, can we take a minute actually right now and say, um, it, uh, let's give people um, a slightly more granular look into how this actually is going to work. Um, so how does... Um, can, can, can either Mike, or David, or Eric, um, uh, if you know, tell, tell people exactly what the specifics of this plan, uh, what, what they are. Well, let, let me, let, I don't want to dominate the conversation because I think I'd like, I like David to I talk. I'd be the inspiration but, here. But, but I, I, I want to say, look, in, 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 Eric told me the other day when we met that there's $20 billion in donor advised funds managed by the Jewish JFNA around the country. I estimate that number probably, if you include Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, all the rest of the donor advisors, probably $100 billion. I haven't found one yet, except my own, that says if I die, my, my kids are the, are the owners of the, of the donor advised funds that I have, that that 50 to 75% of that money has to be spent Jewishly. No one is indicating in these donor advised funds what has to happen at the end. We're working with others to find the legal language to put that into donor advised funds. So that's one way. The other is to look at your will. The other is to look at your foundation if you have it. The other is to do a charitable remainder trust. There are various situations that our website will have that will guide people through, including not only talking to the children, but talking to their financial advisors or their legal advisors or their accountants. And if they're not in that category, it's a very simple thing to do. Very simple. Eric, is it, um, is it very simple to define what it means to give Jewishly? How are we going to um, define or draw a circle around what counts as uh, inside of that corral? Was that question directed to me? Well, I first want, yeah. I think it's important for uh, you to give us the perspective sure. um, from somebody who's worked in the Jewish communal life, because part of what I think we've seen is, um, let's say, uh, gauzier definitions of uh, what Jewish projects are, in the, specifically in the last, let's say, 15 or 20 years. Um, and right. so how do we define what it means to give Jewishly? What, is, what, is the, what does this actually look like? Right. So it's, it's a great question. And it's why I already mentioned that for me, the, uh, the brilliance of this uh, pledge, which, which I've taken as well, is that, uh, we will, uh, that we will have a responsibility to be in conversation uh, with our children about it. I made the point already, and let me elaborate on it, that you, you aren't born knowing uh, you know, how a community works. I didn't know how a community works as a young person. I saw my parents give to one cause or another cause. I saw the blue, we had the blue box that, you know, that Mike Levin, uh, you know, waved. Um, but, uh, but I didn't know what the intricacies of a community are. So we have to draw people in. It's part of our responsibility at, uh, at the federations, in the federation system. It's part of, uh, of all communal leaders responsibility to draw our, uh, our generations into the conversation about how community works. You know, when I was uh, still at Hillel, uh, we used to joke the number one, uh, you know, the number one expenditure in our budget was Starbucks gift cards. Now, of course, it was a little exaggeration, but, but, but the point was that we were always uh, making sure that student leaders who had already become leaders in the community um, and uh, and, uh, and and young and our professionals were always sitting down and talking to uh, students, and you know we were always sitting down and asking them about what their interests were, um, and then through their interests, drawing them in to the community. So little by little, they would see what the whole picture 
of a community is. And then, as we well know in Jewish life, you know, there are core institutions of, of Jewish life, how we take care of each other, how we educate uh, uh, each other, our, our, our synagogues, uh, our, our camps and, uh, and, uh, and other you know, community centers, uh, our youth groups. Um, and, and then there's also great innovation. And Alana, we always want to be clear that investing in, uh, in Jewish innovation and in creativity and in entrepreneurial you know, spirit uh, you know, is very much within the, within the bounds of what Jewish giving is. But, but, but if people understand, again, the core obligations of community one to another, that we as Jews live in community, we care for each other in community, we pray in community, we mourn in community, we celebrate in community, and what are the core elements of that and how does each of us contribute to maintaining it, um, then I think we'll, we'll, we'll be fine with a broad Jewish definition because if our young people and, our, and the next, the inheritors of these donor advised funds and these uh, states are, are educated, um, I'm confident they'll make the right decisions. Alana, let me, let me share kind of my, my view. Um, I actually don't think this is about uh, the definition of Jewish giving. I don't think this is about a contract from the grave. If we do our jobs right, and we tell our children and our heirs and the successors of our foundations and our donor advised fund, uh, what is Jewish giving to us? They will figure out what is Jewish giving to them. I don't think this is about um, dictating. I think it is about how do we conduct ourselves now uh, so that our children and our heirs and the successors um, understand what it means to us, and that will inspire what it means to them. I would also say, and this is expanding the scope of the, 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 the Jewish uh, pledge, is let's not wait until we're dead to give away as much money as we can. Let's not uh, create cosmic justice or cosmic incentive for people to only be benefited after we're dead. In fact, it is now when people are at risk, organizations are at risk, that all of us need to give away as much as we can to help the people and the organizations that are at risk. At least that's my opinion. Um, and one of the things that I was going to ask um, everyone, and I think that there are certainly people in the audience who are uh, curious about it. Um, I'm going to ask everyone in a second. I just have one question that I think will be helpful uh, to ask Terry. I want to ask people whether or not there are any red lines. Um, which is an inevitable question that I think some people have. Before I get to that, um, Terry, you know, uh, I introduced you before, um, so everybody knows who you are. Um, but you, as chairman of the uh, uh, Startup Nation Central um, and the Paul Singer Foundation, in some senses, one might say that you're in the heart of doing present, current work. And so, you know, one would be forgiven for thinking that actually putting your eyes toward the future seems like it's in conflict. You're, you're now, you're, you have your hands deep inside of projects that are uh, healthy, raging, going today. Um, how, why is it that you felt you, it was important for you to also put a marker down the road? That's a fair question. Look, I think when you um, commit yourself to Jewish giving and the security and protection of Israel and the centrality of Israel to the Jewish people, I think you have to look at the present and the future. Um, we're getting older, and we have a bunch of resources to spend on entrepreneurial projects that are relevant today but we don't know what will be more relevant or lose relevance in the future. So the one thing that we wanna do is make sure that all of our foundation, and that's, it's Paul's foundation and I'm, I'm running it for him, um, all of our foundation is spent wisely. Uh, we, we make experiments, sometimes we fail, but we don't want anything to be counter to what we feel is central to the survival of the Jewish people. And what that means is we're working in a current context every day, 
to figure out what can have the most impact, but it we also means that we have to protect this corpus for the future generations. Um, we we are not we do not participate with our children in the foundation um, because we're not sure that our children will spend the money um, in a, in the same way that we want to spend the money. And we also have embedded in our foundation governance a sunset um, so that at the end of whatever, 15 years after we die or 20 years after we die, the money gets spent and we have a board that will spend it for us. And that board of people we know and trust today, and we know and trust that they're young enough and smart enough and committed enough to preserve the, the intention of the donor. I want to say one thing that um, I heard earlier discussed, and I want to give a context as a, as a pleasure to the Gates Buffett stuff. And that is that what we found interesting when we joined it was the intimacy and the shared sort of comfort level to discuss really tough family issues, governance issues, and um, sort of goal issues. Now, no, not everybody at all within the Gates Buffett Giving Pledge has the same goals, but what they do have are families. And therefore, everybody has dysfunctionality at some level. And it was very interesting to us to have people share with us how they navigated their own idiosyncratic dysfunctionality, which is sort of the the name of the game in families. So I think that the Buffett Pledge has been interesting to us for, from a learning perspective. We haven't learned anything about Jewish philanthropy, but we have learned a ton about philanthropy and families and different tricks and different ways in which um, the kids or the, or the governance group um, continues to serve the donor's intent. Um. David, can I just come back to you for a second? I, I want to pick up on uh, something we were talking about uh, earlier, which is um, how you said, you know, one of the ways in which um, our kids will know what it means to give Jewishly is we're going to we're going to have that conversation with them. We're going to tell them um, if part of what uh, might be part of what may be ultimately useful about this bringing this group together is, as Terry said, having that kind of family therapy and being able to give each other advice about how to do the work of this pledge, I would think that part of what you guys would end up talking about is how do we have these conversations? What are some of the, um, what are some of the, uh, the words, the language, literally, that I want to use um, to <coughs> transmit what I'm trying to get at um, so in a funny way, it's like, how, if I were to say, well, you're going to have group therapy or family therapy, what are we starting off talking about? Um, because you, you talked that, that, that basically this is going to come from you. So what are some of the um, guardrails that you feel are already in place to have that conversation? Uh, I, I, thank you for the question. I don't think it's about guardrails. Uh, I think it is about um, teaching by example. And in our conversations, so look, um, different people have different approaches. Some people don't want their kids involved. Some people do want their kids involved. Uh, for us, it is absolutely all about the children. Um, and, you know, our kids are, you know, uh, you know, 9, 11, 13. So they're at a different level and a different stage. But we talk about that we are very fortunate and we have an obligation to our community, and that means the civic community, the American community, and the Jewish community. And the Jewish community means local, national, and, and international in Israel. And we, we talk about that, yes, we support the Atlanta Zoo and the Atlanta Aquarium, and that is a civic, uh, for us, it's a, it's a civic duty and a civic obligation. Now, the vast majority of our funds are gonna support Jewish causes, because if not us, who? And so we talk about uh, that, that, that we, we are very fortunate 
to have uh, earned this wealth and that now we are stewards of it. And um, so for us, it's a, it's, it's a, it's, it, this is not about contract and dictate. This is, they see how we live. They see what decisions we make. Um, we talk about those decisions and we hope that that's inspiring to them. If we, if we um, are authentic and sincere about what are our priorities, hopefully there will be important parts of that that will resonate. But I, I just wanna, wanna emphasize that it's not only about um, giving Jewish. Like we, we have a, a fucking global pandemic. People are hurt. People are losing their jobs. And if we don't help, who will? And, and so to me, there is an incredible sense of urgency far beyond uh, this amazing construct for when we die. Um, maybe in some of the other, uh, you know, I hear it and I, and I get the, um, the inspiring potential here. Um, I, it also seems to me, just as an outsider, that there's an implicit um, anxiety underneath this, that a future generation won't naturally, of its own accord, um, maintain the commitment to uh, Jewish life. And so maybe Mike, you can start, but I'd also love to hear from Terry and Eric um, about whether or not how you um, how you understand the feelings, those feelings that brought you to this pledge, um, and how how to transmit um, to a future generation that this isn't about questioning their judgment even before they walk in the door, but is actually about wanting to create a partnership uh, with them. Well, I. Uh, I had that conversation with my children, uh, and it was last Passover. Uh, last, can you hear me? I'm not a, yeah, me, yeah. Uh, last, last Passover at the Seder. We have another opportunity coming up on April 8th uh, at the Seder, which will probably be done for many families virtually. This will be the first time in my life that I will not have my family with me. My children are 53, 52, and 50. And I have grandchildren that range from four to 21. So, uh, but last year we were together. And last year we talked about the Jewish Future Pledge. We talked about what was happening in the donor advised funds and in the will and everything else. And, and, and my grandchildren and my, and my sons said right at the meeting that we'll all participate. They will participate together to do the giving. Now, it's fortunate for me that one of my sons is a vice president of the Federation and one of them is, uh, was president of a day school and whatever, they've been involved. But they also know what's being left approximately to them in terms of their situations. And we had that conversation. And things that I do Jewishly uh, are exposed. And so uh, they may agree with some, they may agree with not, but I, I say what you do Jewishly is your choice because times will change. In this emergency, which is now taking place, this is a perfect example. David mentioned it. The Federation has always has mentioned it already. My email is, is stuffed up with every Jewish organization needing help. That does not mean in any way, shape, or form that we're not going to help them. We are going to help them. But if in the next generation there is no money to help the Jewish organizations and the generation after that. So my concern is, about 20 to 27 to 30% of Jewish people are actually involved. That's the numbers I generally see. I'm worried if only 10% are involved. I'm not going after the 27, the, the 73% that aren't involved. I'm going after the 27%. So uh, I, I think, I think you, you use the holidays, you use those situations when the family is together to discuss the Jewish problem, the Jewish opportunity, you know, the little blue box that I held up, I read it the other day, and it says on the front, we redeem and reclaim the land of Israel. That was the job. Did my grandparents, what did they do with their pennies? That's what they were doing. We can do it with our dollars. We want to make sure. In this crisis, yes, we want to help Americans. Yes, we want to help those in Italy. Yes, we want to help other people, and we will. But the fact is, no one's going to help us if we don't help us. 
That's how I see we, we only have a few more minutes. Um, uh, they're telling me uh, uh, we're going to throw it out to some Q&A um, if we can do it. Um, uh, but before we go, I was hoping, um, since part of this pledge is about um, peering down the road or seeing into the future, um, if you guys could, in your own way, and however specific or general you want to get, could say, if I would if I were to tell you that something was a reality in 30 years, and that was a reality because of this pledge, what would make you happy? It could be an area of funding that turned up. It could be uh, the role of your own family. Um, it could be a, a Jewish communal uh, development. Um, what, what, would, what would make you happy to learn that you had been a part of? I, I'm willing, I'll start and just say very quickly, uh, I've been on my, uh, on my horse about education and engagement with the next generation. Um, what, what each family is doing by signing this pledge is giving Jewish communal leaders, like those I represent and all the terrific organizations, Terry, that you and, and Paul and the foundation support and David supports and Mike supports, um, an opportunity to be in conversation with the next generation. If they know that, the, that their parents and grandparents uh, made this pledge, asked them to give Jewishly, it is then an education and engagement moment for the Jewish community uh, to help them become inspired uh, by something that they can do that is their generation's equivalent of that blue box that Mike you know, so beautifully said. Um, and so my 30 year vision would be that the next generation, it may not be the same things that inspired me or inspired, uh, you know, Mike or his parents, but is inspired Jewishly inspired to give and to lead in the Jewish organizational space. Cause in that sense, then the, the creativity I mean, Judaism never looks the same, identically the same one generation to the next. Um, but if this next generation is engaged Jewishly because the pledge nudged them in that direction and then the community uh, and the organizations, both the innovators and the entrepreneurs and the establishment uh, engage them, then I think it'll have been a huge success. Harry? Look, I think the Jewish pledge is brilliant and urgent. And I think that because I'm not confident that the future generations of American Jews, apart from the Orthodox, are going to be committed to the same identity set of values and, um, and belief in, in, the, in, the, in the necessity and in the, in the centrality of, of Jewish values and Jewish life. Um, for us, I think it's, it's a kind of a, it's an insurance policy. When, when we first heard it from, from um, Mike and Amy Holtz, it was instant. There was no, it, we didn't have any Oh, how does this work and how does that work and let's let's tweak it here or tweak it there. It's a genius idea. It's genius because it signals the right values, the right commitment, and the right continuity of commitment. And um, I look, David is lucky. He has young children that he can influence with his with his way of life. And obviously, Mike did something right with his kids. But um, if, if, if you're like Paul and I, and you led a very assimilated way of life, then you didn't focus as much on the Jewish values and um, the necessity of the continuity of Judaism. And I think that the Jewish pledge puts a marker down and says, we made the money, and this is how you have to spend it. And you don't have um, endless options. If you want to save the whales, save Jewish whales. <laughs> I want to go get, get Terry, save the Jewish whales <laughs> t-shirt. You know, I, I think actually Terry has encapsulated much of perhaps the missed opportunity of the Jewish American experience for the last 40 years. Um, I, and you, you asked me, uh, Elena, the question about, you know, what would success be? It is about Jewish education, um, and, and I, I mean Jewish education, 
So yeah, I wish, I hope 30 years from now, attendance in day school is 10 times what it is. As opposed to where we are today, it's 40% what it was. Horrible. So we're going to have even less educated Jews um, is the trajectory that we're on now. I hope that we have Jewish high schools that are considered the best academic and Jewish schools that anybody would want to go to and that enrollment is 10 times. And, and, and candidly, um, if, if I'm going to be ambitious, 30 years from now, the federations should be raising 10 times as much money from the Jewish community from more donors um, than seeing their campaign stall. But, but it all starts, in my opinion, with Jewish education, because without it, what's the point? Um, and, and it is that Jewish aspect and that, and that um, uh, uh, connection and, and religious learning. It doesn't mean you have to be Orthodox, but we ought to know what, what our religion is. Mike, do you want to close us out with what you hope? Uh, you imagine might happen in 30 years, and then we're going to uh, throw it out for Q&A with the audience. So I'm going to use another prop, if you don't mind. This is a book. It's 21 Lessons for the 21st Harari Century. Harari Buck. By Noah Harari. Uh, in this book, he does not indicate the necessity for the Jewish people to continue on, mm. on their job. Those are my words. You can be, you've already read it. It's in there. Uh, my job with the Jewish Future Pledge is to help buy the insurance at no cost to, for the Jewish people in the state of Israel to survive through charitable giving in North America specifically. Uh, if I wake up from my grave, uh, which will probably not last, I'll probably get there before 30 years, if I were to wake up 30 years from now and look, what I would see, number one, is that the state of Israel is strong and surviving and that the Jewish communities, the Jewish communities all over the world are in no worse a state than they are today and much better a state because they will have doubled their population by that time. And we will not have to worry about the contribution that the Jewish people have made to society in general and to Jewish people specifically will continue to be there for all time. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, this is really great. Tamar is going to help us uh, uh, ask some questions from the audience, uh, but on behalf of me, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And thank you to all the panelists and all of the participants. We've had over 240 people join us today, which is wonderful. We have so much going on today at JFN that in another five minutes, we're going to ask everybody to join us on another link. So we're going, I can't go too much over right now, but I just want to tell everybody, we, I see all the questions in the chats and the uh, q and I'm writing them down and we'll, we'll share them with all the panelists if we can't get to them and get back to you. You can also reach me with additional questions at tamar at jfunders.org because we do want to make sure that your questions are answered and we apologize that that we're going to have to cut it a bit shorter than we would want to. But with that, I guess I will ask one, one quick question um, that just came in is, what will be done to ensure that, Jewish, that the Jewish pledge will be inclusive, inclusive of both diaspora and Israeli donors, especially in our, in our network, we have people from all over in the JFN network. So can I, a few would like to can I simplify that? Because I've seen a lot of questions and I think what people don't understand is yeah. it's your frigging pledge. You define what it means to you. This is not me or Mike Levin or Terry or Eric telling anybody what to do. You define in your own language, in your own words, what is Jewish to you. That's it. It's that simple. This is not Mike Levin going up to the mountain, coming down and telling the rest of us, this is the definition of Jew. Everybody relax. It's whatever it, it, the definition is for you. Thank you so much for that clarification. Anybody else have an additional thought on that? I think that actually was very helpful for lots of that was coming in. Uh, uh, Tim, let me just say, 90% of the diaspora is in North America. That was a statement used by David Horowitz two years ago when I saw him speak in Aspen. And it's sad in my mind. 
if I protect the 90% of the diaspora in North America to do what they're supposed to do, we will help the rest of the diaspora that's out there in the state of Israel. So my concentration so far has been in North America. Obviously, we hope to viral this concept around the world, around the globe, and in Israel. But the first and foremost strategy is North America.